Uh, yes, welcome everyone uh, to the seminar on September 28, 2023, which is part of the ARC seminar series. I will briefly explain the logistics. We have two speakers. Um, first, Peter Meisman, who will talk um, approximately for 45 minutes. And then one hour later, we will have a shorter talk from Felix uh, Drost for about half an hour um, talking. Um, all the talks uh, here on the seminar series are recorded and can be found on the YouTube channel. So I will start introducing the first uh, speaker, Peter Meismann. Uh, he's an associate professor at the University of Antwerp, uh, where he leads um, an immunoinformatics group. He has published many papers and patents on uh, TCR uh, profiling, mainly also TCR epitope uh, profiling. And his main research focus lies on the use of artificial intelligence to gain understanding in the adaptive immune system. Um, notably, he has published many tools also for T cell receptor analysis, such as T-Rex, Cluster, and Imrex. He has also won a number of rewards, most recently the GSK Vaccine Award. Um, He's also um, a part-time CTO of ImmuneWatch, an, an AI company aiming to decode the T-cell receptor repertoire. And also he's one of the main organizers of the TCR meeting in Antwerp, uh, which I really like a lot. And um, he's going to talk to us today about um, TCR epitope prediction models. Peter, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, I'll share my screen. Okay, um, so uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm quite happy to be here. Um, so as Victor mentioned, I'm both, uh, I have an academic lab uh, focusing on uh, diesel profiling, as well as I'm the CTO of ImmuneWatch. So actually a company that also does TCR epitope prediction things. And I'm actually quite excited to be able to actually show some results from both of these here today. So what I'm going to be talking about is actually the problem of TCR epitope prediction. Now, normally I would have to start with a lengthy introduction on what TCRs are, what epitopes are, and why this is all important. But given this audience, I kind of decided to skip all that and get down to the meat of the story. Being, we want to create a machine learning model that can link TCR sequences to a specific epitope. So for example, we want to know this specific TCR sequence, can it bind this specific epitope, yes or no? And we actually want to apply this into various different contexts. Now, immediately I'm going to make the distinction between what I would call the seen epitope problem and the unseen epitope problem. So in the seen epitope problem, we are actually trying to make predictions for epitopes that we have seen before, that are part of our training data set. And the unseen epitope problem is where we are trying to extrapolate the binding rules to actually be able to do this kind of prediction for any epitope. I'm going to go into a bit more detail as the, as the talk goes on, um, but that's where we're going to start. So with this seen epitope problem. Now, this seen epitope problem can actually just be reduced to a binary classification problem. We simply have a set of TCRs that we know bind a specific epitope, for example, these TCRs here in red, and a set of TCRs that we assume do not bind this epitope, these TCRs here in blue, and we simply want to create a machine learning model that finds a decision boundary that separates these two spaces, so that if we then have a new TCR, we can identify if this binds this epitope, yes or no. So um, there have been quite a lot of methods that have been published in this regard, um, and they all work reasonably well. Um, but I'm going to actually preface this a bit with reasonably well in the context that they have been tested in. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, I've actually put in a few slides where I'm actually going to have some bold claims, where these are things that let's say, I personally believe in, but I'm very much open to discussion. I'm hoping that this will kind of, um, let's say, foster a discussion near the end of the talk, or feel free to contact me afterwards, because these are things that I'm very open to discuss. So my first bold claim in this regard is that the way that we're currently evaluating these TCR epitope prediction models um, isn't entirely correct. Or at least the way we're capturing their performances doesn't really represent a realistic case or 
really says anything about the, how these methods will actually perform in reality. And I'm also including many of my own papers in this regard as well. And I'm hoping to actually be able to show you uh, a bit more about what I mean by this during this talk. So the typical way that these models are evaluated is that you start with a big data set. So for example, the VDJDB, which has TCR, epitope, um, uh, data sets. Um, then you split this. I think someone isn't muted. Isn't, um, it, uh, um, and then you split this data set up into a training data set and a test data set. Uh, and often you also have a validation data set. But all of this data is actually originating from the same data set of a um, nice set of positive TCR epitope pairs. Um, in addition, very typically, you actually work through the kind of cross-validation setup where you actually have, um, actually divide your data set up into groups and you each time leave out one part of the group where each group contains both positive samples and negative samples. So TCRs that are known to bind the, the epitope and TCRs that are hopefully known not to bind the epitope. But very quickly, we're running into the issue here of where do these negatives actually come from? So what are these blue TCRs here? Where do these come from? Because all these data sets are, are really good. Uh, the VDJDBs, the IDBs of the world. But of course, they hardly contain any negative pairings. So they don't have any negative TCR EPTO pairs. Um, and even the concept of a negative TCR is a bit strange because, of course, every TCR from a non-naive cell at least binds something. It's just that we actually don't always know what it is. So that means that we just have a set of TCRs where we don't know the answer that we could perhaps use as negatives um, or specific combinations that we can use. Now, there's two ways of actually generating this kind of negative data uh, that are commonly being used. The first is through shuffling, wherein we take the positive pairs, so we have a list of TCRs that bind an epitope, and we just shuffle them around so that we create new combinations that we assume will be negative, where we assume that if it's known to bind one epitope, it's less likely to bind another epitope from the same data set. Um, so that's one strategy. The second strategy is to actually use negatives from a background data set. Now, very commonly, this is TCRs from um, a healthy individual, a sim simply a full TCR repertoire, where you simply take those TCRs and pair them with the epitopes that you had in your positive data set. So these are two broad strategies that you can actually apply to actually generate these negatives. However, um, I'm really going to start with prefacing this, this, this second um, strategy where you actually use the background data actually has a large issue. Because these TCRs are actually selected from a different data set, um, many of our machine learning models, because they're quite smart and quite intelligent, actually very quickly learn the difference between what a background TCR is and what a tetramer sorted TCR is. Um, and as we and others have already shown, is that actually models are actually then able to um, learn the difference between, let's say, these TCRs originating from background TCR, from a background data set, and those originating from the positive data set, so that um, the predictions are actually solely based on the TCR without any regards of the epitope. So we've published a few papers about these, and I do encourage you to have a look at them if you want to know more about this. Um, however, this is still a bit of a controversial statement, so that's why I kind of added it as my second bold claim, where I will preface this by stating that epitope shuffled negatives is definitely the preferred strategy for training your model. So if you want to make sure that your model is trained with as least bias as possible, you should actually be using uh, epitope shuffled negatives. However, a performant model, so if you actually have a model that is able to learn the uh, epitope TCR pairing, it should actually work on test data sets generated with both strategies. So that means that if you have a performant model, irrespective of which of the two it has been trained on, you can actually use test data sets of both strategies. And I actually do encourage you to actually use both because it might give you a bit more insight into how this model actually performs. Um, so to go a bit deeper into one specific example, I'm going to talk 
at least for a bit, uh, the next 10 minutes, a bit about the IMREP benchmark. So I mean, call it the IMREP benchmark because this was a public benchmark that was run at the IMREP conference last year, wherein a bunch of Apidoc TCI researchers got together uh, that had all built some models, defined a training data set and a test data set, and made a head-on comparison of these models on unblinded data. Now, this wasn't fully unblinded data because all of this data actually came from the VDJDB. So just very quickly, how was this benchmark constructed? So we had a set of 16 epitopes, which had more than 50 paired alpha and beta chains from VDJDB. Um, so you actually have a data set, so a set of TCRs for each epitope. Then we actually created a training data set and a test data set for every one of these epitopes, wherein we have a training data set containing positive samples, um, just taken from VDJDB, and then negative samples, which for the most part contained um, shuffled TCRs from other epitopes, where we say, okay, these are TCRs binding a different epitope, so you can use this as negative data for, for instance, this NLV epitope over here. And then we did a very simple train test split of 80-20, uh, where we just randomly distributed the TCRs between the training set and the test data set, made the test data set blinded, and then asked everyone to make their predictions on it. Now, we learned a lot of very interesting things about this benchmark. Um, and we actually were able to apply almost 20 models, models on uh, this data set. Um, and we learned several interesting things, such as that indeed uh, models that use alpha beta chains um, are uh, more performant than those that use uh, betas or alphas alone. But one of the interesting things that I want to highlight here that I don't think we even discussed that much in the actual workshop report was that actually the top four best performing models here, so TCREX, TCRGP, and TCRDIST, are actually all four what I would call single epitope models. Now, it has already been established in a few other papers that for some reason, single epitope models seem to perform better than what is called a multi-epitope model. So just to qu quickly explain the difference. So a single epitope model is a model wherein you make predictions for a single epitope. So that means that in your training data, you simply train uh, on this one single uh, training data set containing positives for this epitope and negatives for this epitope. You train your model, and then you apply it to your test data. So in this case, this model should actually mostly focus on the patterns contained within our positive samples. This is contrasted to a multi-epitope model. So in this case, we are not restricted to a single epitope, but we actually train on all epitopes at the same time. Um, so in this case, this was all 16 epitopes, wherein you again had your positive and your negative data, and then the model simply had to, again, uh, be applied on the test data. Um, but the strange thing is, and it is actually very peculiar if you think about it, is that these models actually perform, perform worse than the single epitope ones. Because in this case, the negative data sets are all from TCRs that are known to bind other epitopes. And these are all other epitopes that they have actually seen in their uh, training data. So they actually should have more information to conclude that these TCRs um, are negatives because they are also just trained on a larger training data set. But for some reason, they have more trouble um, distinguishing positives from negatives. Now, when I say more trouble, it is still slightly relative. We're talking about a single digit performance gain in most cases. So best not to describe too much to it, but it's quite curious that the single epitope models actually perform a bit better. So. My own theory about this is that this has a lot to do with the negatives. Because if we consider, for example, here, this negative TCR in for this test data, this model might be less inclined to actually assign this a negative score. Uh, because the last time it actually saw this TCR, it um, was perhaps more close to a positive than to a negative. Because of course you have this set of negative, uh, this set of yellow TCRs over here for the NQK uh, epitope that were listed as positives. So if you kind of reduce this down even further, if you have this as your training data where you have yellow TCRs bind 
N2K, blue TCR spined NLV, new trainer model. And then you give it as a test data that a yellow TCR binds NLV. It might be less inclined to actually label this as a negative because at no point did we actually explain to this model that what it's trying to predict is actually this combination between a TCR and an epitope. All it sees is the features of the TCRs, the features of the epitope put together in a single typically neural network and then out comes a score. So in this case, it can easily conclude this yellow TCR looks a lot like a positive TCR. This epitope looks like a positive epitope. Therefore, this might be a positive uh, interaction or a positive pair. Um, and this is why I believe these multi-epitope models don't work so well because they have trouble kind of learning this relationship. Now, this concerned me a bit because um, as was mentioned, so I'm also the CTO of ImmuWatch. And one of the things that we do in ImmuWatch is we actually build these kind of TCR epitope prediction models. Uh, and we actually built one a few years ago called uh, ImmuWatch Detect, which is kind of the spiritual successor of TCRx. Now, one of the primary differences for this model is that it is a multi-epitope prediction model. So it also bases itself on all data for all epitopes to build a single model to then be applied on any kind of data set. Um, and while it is definitely inspired by TCRx, it has several other changes, in particular also to how it approaches this problem a bit. Um, so in contrast to actually looking at this as a binary classification problem, what the text actually does is state, given the information contained within this DCR sequence, what is the most likely epitope that it can bind? Given all of the epitopes in my database that I've seen before, um, uh, and actually give a score of, okay, what is the likelihood? And can, it can actually conclude that it doesn't think that it will bind any epitope that it has seen before. Now, of course, once this public benchmark was done and I actually saw that these multi-epitope models were less performant, I immediately asked the people at the MuWatch to also try out uh, the detect algorithm on the same data set. And what we found was actually quite surprising um, because here is the detect data set and here is for every dot is, a, is an epitope. And we actually found that it actually outperforms pretty much every single method out there uh, by quite some margin to the point where the first time I saw this result, I actually thought that something had gone wrong, that there was a sort of information bleed, that we were doing something incorrectly. So we actually ended up re-rendering this, uh, this benchmark a few times internally. Uh, we actually re rebuilt the entire evaluation platform twice, um, but still the same results kept coming out. So we actually wanted to investigate, okay, why is this algorithm seemingly performing so well on this data set? Um, and to kind of uh, illustrate this, I'm going to zoom in on one of these epitopes, the NLV epitope. Now, this is one of the epitopes for which most methods are able to only give a very poor performance. Typical methods have a performance about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 AUC, and the detect algorithm had a performance of about 0 0.92. Uh, so much higher than uh, any of the other methods. Now, because the text also allows interpretation to why it's assigning these scores, we could actually dig deep into what exactly was going on here. And actually, the results were quite interesting. So what I'm showing here is just uh, some positive samples. So these are 10 positive TCRs that are known to bind the NLV epitope. I'm giving you here the scores generated by TCRx and the scores generated by detect. So the scores for these regs are between 0 and 1, for the detect are between minus 1 and 1. And what you can immediately see is that actually those TCRs that have a higher score for TCRx usually also have a higher score for detect. In both cases, a higher score means more likely to bind this epitope. And those that have a low score also have a low score in both algorithms. And in fact, this is a bit of a general trend. And overall, we found that the tech is about 10 to 20% better at assigning these positive uh, scores. So a marginal improvement, but not enough to explain this difference of uh, jumping from a AOC of 0 0.7 to an AOC of 0 0.9. So something else is going on here. Um, 
And this actually had more to do with the negative samples in this case. Because here, TCRX, uh, so these are all TCRs binding different epitopes. So these were the negative samples for this data set. And here, TCRX has, again, lower scores, which is what you expect for a performant model. However, the scores are around 0 0.05 to 0 0.2. So this is about in the same range as those positive samples. Now, the scores for detect are much lower. In fact, significantly lower. Uh, and they are much lower than the positive samples, which is also why we are seeing such a high OEC. Um, and this has a lot to do with the fact that detect is a multi-epitope prediction model. And the fact is that we are looking at this problem in a different manner. Because what, TC, what the detect is actually doing when it's seeing these TCRs is, is actually classifying them as different epitopes. So we actually had a look at what epitopes were being predicted. Um, and of course, because this is a multi-epitope uh, model, it was actually able to train on all of the epitopes in the data set. And we actually saw that it actually was able to classify most epitopes correctly. And this makes sense because there are some epitopes that are quite easy to predict in this data set. It is also quite a performant method. So it was actually able to very rapidly identify those TCRs that actually bind different epitopes. And once it made this conclusion, it made it actually less likely uh, for any of these TCRs to bind the NLV epitope because it concluded that these TCRs, uh, these epitopes, were far too different from anything associated with NLV. So this is why we actually see suddenly a very high performance on this benchmark. Now, we kind of already knew from the start when we even designed this benchmark uh, a year ago that it was inherently a bit flawed because, of course, we didn't have a lot of data to work with. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had alpha-beta pairing. We wanted to make sure that there were enough uh, TCRs for every epitope so that every model could train on them. But, of course, this, isn't, this wasn't a very realistic benchmark um, because... For one thing, the number of positives versus the number of negatives um, is highly inflated. We only have one positive for every three negatives, um, which is not really a realistic scenario if you consider that um, very often we're looking more uh, one in amongst tens or hundreds of thousands of TCRs. In addition, uh, this is a fairly easy problem to solve because, of course, the negatives are extracted from shuffled epitopes meaning that if you're actually able to predict these epitopes, um, you actually are able to get a high performance. It again isn't very realistic, considering that the diversity of negatives is realistically a lot higher. Um, so we wanted to actually move this a bit further and actually have a more unbiased estimation of how these models perform. And we actually fell back again here to the standard approach of just simply building a large database of TCR epitope data uh, and seeing how far we get. Um, and this build brings me to my third bold claim. Um, and I think most people realize this, but I feel like it's somewhat underappreciated in the field, is that many of the known TCR epitope pairs uh, in databases like VDJDB and IADB um, are incorrect due to false positives. Uh, simply due to the fact that the experiments used to generate this data, if you're thinking about tetramer staining, if you're thinking about uh, dextramer uh, labeled single cell sequencing, have a false positive ratio. We know that um, typically it's not, a, I would almost say, not an exact science in the sense that uh, cutoffs have to be set, that decisions need to be made, that of course there is just some false specificity in there. And my personal estimate is that uh, between five to 30% of pairs in these databases is wrong, uh, which is not to say that I don't appreciate the enormous effort that went into these databases, um, both collecting this data as well as generating them originally. Uh, and I don't think it's really a fault of the experimenters, but it's simply the fact that these methods that we're using to generate this data simply has an inherent false positive potential. Um, now, what does this mean exactly for uh, our TCR epitope prediction models? Well, this means that we're learning them on 
data that is already a bit has a bit of a, a, a wonky ground truth to it, and we're also evaluating it on the same data. Um, so just uh, within uh, ImmuneWatch, because of course we're building these models, we also wanted to have our own data set of TCR epitope data. And what we actually ended up doing was actually building our own database because we didn't want to rely on those that were already established in the public literature. So we ended up curating about 300,000 T cell receptors uh, and their potential epitopes from the literature. And we then applied quite stringent filtering, definitely not enough yet, but stringent filtering to get this down to about 114,000, maybe correct TCRs covering about 1,700 different epitopes. And then we add some extra proprietary data to have a more robust uh, data set. So this is probably by far one of the biggest collections uh, that I'm at least aware of. And we actually wanted to apply again these, these same epidote prediction models on this data set, knowing now that, of course, now we have uh, a much larger diversity of TCRs, much larger diversity of epidopes. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to get a bit more estimates on what exactly is going on. And the way that we actually did this was using what we call a leave one study out cross validation, where we um, used all of the different uh, experimental data, trained a model, and then each time applied it to a left out data set. And uh, very specifically in our case, we didn't even tell the model which epitope it was supposed to test. Um, because that's one of the big advantages of uh, our approach in the sense that we don't need to specify what epitopes are there. It just compares it to those that it already knows. Uh, and in this case, we get a global AUC of about uh, 0.92, which is quite good. Uh, but again, this is probably still a bit inflated due to the fact that we're still working on tetra distorted data. Um, however, it's kind of gotten to the point where I'm quite confident that um, we're probably not going to be able to get this much higher given the data sets that we currently have. Uh, simply also due to the fact that there are false positives in this data means that um, we will never get an AUC of about one. We don't expect to get an AUC of, of one because of the these presences of these false positives in this data. And to very quickly illustrate this, I'm going to go back to the NLV epitope that I showed before. So this is a TCR that is both present in the IMRED benchmark, um, as well as in our uh, own internal data set, um, simply because we, it was curated from the same study. Now, according to, let's say, pretty much all of the literature, this should be an NLV epitope, uh, reactive epitope, uh, NLV epitope reactive TCR. However, if we then actually apply the detect algorithm on this epitope, what we actually see is it actually predicts this as um, not binding NLV, not even binding the HLA molecule, but actually binding the MR1 uh, receptor uh, and this metabolite. So actually what the detect algorithm is saying is that this is in fact a mate cell. So uh, a mucosal associated invariant T cell. And indeed, if we look at this TCR sequence, we can actually see that it actually has all the properties associated with these mate cells. Uh, and it's actually just to very quickly illustrate that um, this is most likely a false positive in this data that a mate cell might have snuck into um, this data set. We of course don't know for sure that it doesn't bind NLV. Uh, but given these predictions and given, uh, let's say, the, the structure of the TCR, I do actually expect it to be a false positive. And this has nothing to do with the original experimenters and nothing to do with the way this was curated. It's simply the fact that these experiments aren't foolproof. Um, but this, of course, brings us to, again to an issue that we're still not really evaluating these methods properly. Um, because we're still only using a limited amount of epitopes. In addition, we, if we actually take a step back, we are probably not even using these models correctly in the sense that we're not using them to identify multimer sorted cells, which is what we're always applying them uh, to actually do. Um, and so that is why I would actually consider maybe shifting this a bit, or I would like to advocate shifting this a bit and to actually apply them to other problems. Um, 
And um, I'm going to very quickly illustrate one here. So I'm going to make a bit of a side note um, because one of the, let's say, one of my favorite papers in, in recent years that kind of inspired a lot of the things that I do was this Emerson paper from 2017, where um, adaptive showed that they're actually able to classify CMV seropositivity simply by using enriched public clonotypes. So in this case, they use a top-down approach wherein they collected a set of several hundred of individuals seropositive, several hundred of uh, individuals seropositive, um, and identified a set of 200 TCRs that were more common in the uh, seropositive ones, and used that as a basis to create a very simple classifier. And it's quite intriguing that this works. Um, however, it probably usually mostly works so well for CMV because uh, CMV has a tendency to create very public and very frequent clonotypes within repertoires. Uh, but still, it's an interesting thought on how TCR sequencing can actually be used for diagnostics. Now, we could actually work instead of a top-down approach from a bottom-up approach. We could actually use um, these TCR sequences to actually look at diagnostics in a different way. Because the disadvantage of using a top-down approach like adaptive used is that essentially you're highlighting TCRs that you think might be associated with CMV or might be associated with some comorbidity or might be associated with some other factor within your data set. Um, but I would actually advocate that if we actually have epitope prediction models, so that's going to be my fourth claim, um, that they should actually also work to stratify full repertoires based on disease history. If we can identify people based on uh, TCRs for CMV positivity and CMV negativity, we should also just be able to use, use for instance, CMV epitope prediction models to distinguish between CMV seropositivity and CMV seronegativity if these are indeed TCRs um, associated with CMV. Now, I'm not going to show you a CMV example. What I'm going to show you is another example. Uh, but the concept is always going to be the same. So we have, again, here a set of people with a specific disease, uh, the yellow samples, people without this disease, the blue samples. And we're going to annotate their TCR repertoires to identify those T cells that um, are associated with epitopes derived from whatever pathogen it is that uh, is being included here. Um, and the example I'm going to give here is going to be COVID, because there's a lot of COVID data. There's a lot of COVID epitope TCR data. So then the question becomes, can we actually use COVID epitope TCR prediction models to predict COVID uh, repertoires? So we simply assign uh, those TCRs that are uh, SARS-CoV-2 specific, or that are related to SARS-CoV-2 specific epitopes, and we use that, that as the basis for a diagnostic classifier. Um, and these are the results for the most straightforward application. So you'd simply take 80 COVID patients, 80 healthy patients, and you try to identify um, which are the COVID patients simply based on the amount of hits you get for SARS-CoV-2 epitopes. So nothing else, no other fancy machine learning except for the epitope prediction models and the detect algorithm. And what we actually see is that we're actually able to achieve an AOC of 0.8, which is already quite respectable given that we have such a simple, straightforward approach. And in fact, what actually I found quite exciting is that we're actually able to get a sensitivity of almost 0.5 with almost 100% specificity. So we're able to pick up about half of these COVID patients almost perfectly without any negatives. Um, and this is accounting for the fact that this was only based on 773 epilopes, so the epilopes that are in our database, spread out only over 10 MHC variants, of which half map to A0201, because of course, this is the most common HLA that's tested in a lot of these circumstances. This is also not accounting for any cross-reactivity because several papers have come out in recent weeks even that have shown that uh, there's quite a few individuals that have uh, prior existing immunity to uh, SARS-CoV-2 due to infection from other coronaviruses. And this is based on full TCR repertoire. So something where we expect that the signal might not be as strong. Um, and in fact, this last point is something we actually had a closer look at. Uh, we actually collaborated together with the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp, where 
we actually sorted out activated T cells from COVID patients. So we, instead of looking at the full TCR repertoire, we only looked at um, the activated T cell subset. Uh, we then sequenced these and again applied the same TCR EPTO prediction models. And actually what we were able to see then is that indeed we were able to boost this signal um, and that we can very easily actually distinguish um, people with active COVID infection uh, from people who had a past COVID infection, as well as other individuals that might have had other unrelated uh, infections. So in this case, our baseline was uh, people that had recently gotten uh, vaccines against um, a completely unrelated virus. And in all cases, we saw that the activated subset of the patients go undergoing acute COVID infection had the highest by far uh, signal with regards to SARS-CoV-2 specific T cells based simply on the predictions of these models. Um, so this actually brings me to my next bold claim in the sense that these epitope TCR prediction models, if we're actually able to actually establish them in a robust manner and actually have enough data in our uh, databases, we actually have the potential for a very powerful TCR-based diagnostic uh, because we would actually be able to classify um, any number of diseases as long as we have the data in our database. In addition, to very quickly illustrate this, uh, that it actually goes a bit further than this, it doesn't only work for, let's say, infectious diseases, but also for other cases. And so this was actually work that uh, one of my uh, PhD students recently did based on AML patients, where these um, uh, patients had received an immunotherapy so um, this was a hematopoietic uh, uh, cell therapy uh, loaded with the WT1 antigen. And we actually had three groups. We actually had a group of healthy donors, a group of uh, patients that had a relapse, and a, a set of patients that went into clinical remission. Uh, and in each case, we had the TCR sequences available. And what we did is we actually applied, in this case, the TCRX model to assign, uh, to identify those T cells that were reactive against this WT1 antigen. And um, very briefly, what we found, because there was a lot of interesting findings in this data, but very quickly is that we found, as expected, that the healthy individuals had very few T cells against this antigen, uh, and that uh, the AML patients that actually had received this therapy had far more. And in addition, we actually saw a difference between those individuals that went into remission versus those individuals that had a relapse. Because one of the things that we did was we actually had uh, also ran one of our clustering algorithms, uh, class TCR, where we actually grouped together those TCRs that have uh, high similarity. So we actually ended up with about seven groups of highly similar TCRs that all bind one of these two antigens. And we actually saw that those individuals that actually went into remission had a much uh, la more diverse cluster representation of these uh, TCRs. So they seem to actually indicate that this uh, remission might actually be induced by a very diverse, not only in clonotype space, but actually also on very distinct motive space uh, with regards to the TCRs. Um, so this kind of shows that this kind of potential that diagnostic is far greater than just infectious diseases. But at the moment, we are, of course, still limited in, by the epilogues in our database. Um, now, this brings me to the next point. I'm going to go over this quite quickly, um, where we would actually like to make predictions for any epitope. We don't want to be restricted anymore by those epitopes in our database. Um, so we actually end up in what we would call the unseen epitope prediction problem. Um, where, of course, we only have about 2,000 epitopes with known T-cell receptors, and most of interest will therefore not have uh, the data that we need. Um, so we're actually going to use typically a deep learning approach to actually learn TCR epitope relationships. Um, so in this case, still kind of like a binary classification problem, but now we're actually looking for specific combinations of TCRs and their epitopes and deciding if this can bind yes or no. Now, the typical approach to do this is by using 
um, let's say, deep learning approach where if you create an embedding for your TCRs, you create an embedding for your epitopes in some kind of manner, and then actually combine them for a final few layers in your network to actually do your binding prediction. But as I've mentioned before, because of these inherent biases, because we don't have a good negative data set, we actually very quickly end up with data leakage due to imbalances. So how do we actually create this kind of model that can actually, can actually avoid these kind of, kind of biases? So can we perhaps even change the architecture to actually reduce the focus on one side? Um, so can we actually move this a bit further up to actually combine these CCR and Aptops a bit earlier? And this is actually something that we actually did a few years ago where we actually designed an architecture where we actually combined the TCRs and Aptops prior to actually learning any kind of neural network. We actually converted each, both the TCR sequence and the Aptop sequence into the physical chemical properties, multiplied them to actually create what we call almost an image because it's a 2D representation, and then fed this into a convolutional neural network to actually decide if this image, so if this combination of TCR and Aptope was a valid one. And in this way, we kind of force it to learn the interaction um, because if it wants to learn a bias in the TCR or in the Aptope, it actually has to first deconvolute this image, um, which makes it a bit harder for the model to overfit. Not saying it doesn't, but uh, it does seem to work well in our hands. And indeed, uh, back then, so this is almost three years ago, based on the data that we currently had available, we actually saw that we were able to get a bit higher than a non-zero performance. Um, that was stati statistically significant from what we generated as kind of a decoy data set with uh, random epitopes. In addition, what we actually saw was that um, even though the performance was a bit only barely better than random, um, almost negligible, is that it actually worked really well if the epitope that we were trying to classify was close enough to the training examples. And by close enough, I mean about within three to four amino acid differences, which actually makes sense given that um, we actually need to extrapolate from uh, our epitope data uh, to our unknown epitope data. Uh, and this actually inspires us a bit to actually think, okay, this is actually feasible if we simply have enough epitope data. Um, and this is going to be one of my final bold claims to kind of wrap up a bit, is that currently unseen epitope prediction is actually uh, limited by data and not by models. I actually expect that if we had enough data, a lot of the models that we currently have would perform really well. And uh, to kind of continue on this for a second, is we probably need about 500,000 TCRs and 5,000 epitopes to actually get a good unseen epitope performance. This would actually be my prediction of when we actually see this shift coming. And we actually notice that indeed the methods that have been published in recent years, because they have more data, actually start performing better and better. And I expect that this will be the turning point. And this is of course very feasible given that I actually expect that we'll be able to generate this type of data actually within the next few years or so. It's actually also one of the ambitions within immune wars to actually generate this data. Um, and we're actually already quite successfully in, in ongoing in that regard. So I actually expect that unseen epitope prediction will become possible in the next two to three years or so. Okay, and I'm going to kind of wrap up here. Um, I would very quickly like to thank uh, both my academic uh, collaborators as well as my industrial collaborators, as well as all the people that were involved in IMREP benchmark. Uh, so this was actually ran uh, and organized by Anne and Virag. Uh, so big thanks to them that I'm actually also allowed to discuss this in this talk, uh, and as well as my different uh, panelists. So thank you for your attention. Thanks, Peter, for this very exciting, so many bold claims. Um, are there any questions? Maybe I have a first question just to increase your blood pressure a bit, um, to make it a bit interesting. Um, I think it was bold claim four and five that uh, we should use the epitope-based data for diagnostics. Um, to me, this seems quite obvious because if we could annotate TCR repertoires um, with their binding information, of course, we should use this for the diagnostics and not just based on public clones. So to me, it's it's quite straightforward. 
Yeah, but I mean, yeah. I kind of want to put forward that this hasn't been done that often. No, because Usually we don't people... have data, right? But of course, if we had the, if we had, I mean, the main function of TCRs is to bind to something, right? So if we could yeah. use the information, of course we should use it. So yeah, but yeah. Um, I tend to agree, with, sorry, if I may, I tend to agree with the speaker that it hasn't actually been done so often. And maybe I have a second question if um, it's possible. Yeah, ask. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I saw the bold claim number six, I think it was, or yeah, I think it was six about data. We are limited by data. Um, is there a possibility on your opinion that we could actually either simulate or do something other than generating data? How could we, what do you think are the potential ways to actually overcome the fact that we don't have data? And what do you think we could do it without the data by leveraging maybe different models there? Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and actually, it's also something that I, I was considering even putting in the presentation, but I realized it was already long enough as is. Um, is there is definitely a lot of room for, let's say, simulated data to actually benchmark a lot of these methods, see what works well in what context and what, what type of types. Um, however, the issue is that if we're actually thinking of the unseen epitope prediction model, so we're actually going towards really making predictions for any epitopes, then we're going to have to rely, I'm afraid, on real data. And the, the reasoning is simple because um, we just don't know the patterns that connect a TCR to an epitope. So we can't really simulate this in a manner that we can then use it to actually train a model. Um, I think simulated data is going to be very useful to actually, um, let's say, identify possible biases in the data sets that we have or uh, in the models that we make. I would definitely argue that once more unseen epitope prediction models um, start to come out that claim to have a high performance, that I would very much also like to see them being benchmarked on simulated data to see if uh, they are actually truly picking up uh, a signal or if they might have uh, several hidden biases. Um, so while I think there is room for, for, sim for simulated data, I think to actually make the models themselves and to actually train them, we're actually going to, going to have to rely on real data. May I do a short follow-up on that? Yeah. Uh, so I was thinking mainly, basically, not on the specific sequence, epitope mapping. So I was thinking there are some machine learning models that actually have incredible, um, I think, outcomes for specific questions. And uh, if we have the repertoire of a person that has a disease, maybe we don't need the information of the specific sequence that actually binds to that epitope. If we could see in the complexity, the patterns, epitope patterns in the complexity of the repertoire. So uh, that was kind of the direction. Yeah. OK, if I think I understand you correctly, is that we wouldn't solely be looking at epitope TCR prediction, then but we'll also be looking at the, the patterns in the repertoire themselves. Exactly. Um, yeah, OK. No, I Sorry for the background that. noise. Yeah, no worries. OK, so we go to Felix, then David, and then Nick. Well, just just quickly, I mean, when you say that we don't have the data, does that mean it doesn't exist or it's not the efforts to curate it like the, you know, OAS and the Air Data Commons and things like that just haven't been able to keep up with the data? Um, I think the data doesn't fully exist yet. I think there's been quite a lot of curation efforts. So we actually ran our own curation efforts, so actually build our own epitope of TCR database. And we realized that while there's still some gains to be made, it is still relatively uh, limited. I think we're really going to need a concentrated effort to generate this data uh, as much as possible. David? Great, thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, Pieter, for this uh, this wonderful talk. Um, uh, obviously, this, this challenge of expanding to new epitopes is the one that everybody is faced with. Um, I was wondering your your view about uh, adding the HLA in the equation and expanding across HLAs. <laughs> Do you think we need to consider the HLA, or you know, we just have the information that is encoded in the peptide in the epitope that tells us a bit about the HLA, and that's okay. Um, yeah, this is a very good question and something I've actually also been considering lately. Uh, I know that there are several methods 
that have been published quite recently that actually include HLA data and report that this works quite well. Um, the big consideration that I have in that regard is that once you start including HLA information, you have to watch out that you don't introduce a new form of data bias mm -hmm. and that you might start classifying HLA type. Um, simply is because there is this imbalance between the different HLAs and it becomes very easy to actually predict HLA A02 uh, from mm -hmm. the rest. Uh, I think we're definitely going to need to make sure that we have in our data set enough HLA diversity and um, that somehow the models should be able to also capture at least the context of the HLAs in some kind of manner. Um, I do believe that there will probably be almost HLA supergroups, so we probably don't need to have the entire uh, space, um, but that I do expect that the best performing methods should also uh, encapsulate HLAs, given that they need to be very careful for any biases. Hmm. Nick? Sorry, I'm unmuting myself. Uh, great talk. Uh, I really I really like the idea of the clinical diagnostic idea as well, especially when it comes to diseases that do antibody panels. I think the cost margin equation is 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 there for TCR sequencing. Um, I must I might have missed this, but what uh, where does your uh, idea of where does the kind of framework that you presented with TCR cross reactivity come into play? Um, you know, TCRs can bind multiple yeah. epigenes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so that's something that I, I kind of skimmed over, but I'm very happy that I got this question. Um, so actually our, our model actually accounts for cross-reactivity because we actually realized that this is an important thing that is actually often missed by a lot of elder epitope prediction methods. In fact, the common way of doing this is to simply exclude any TCRs that are bound by multiple epitopes, and we don't believe that that's right. Um, so very quickly, um, is it actually distinguishes two types of cross-reactivity. Uh, the first is if um, a TCR can bind epitopes that are highly similar. By highly similar, I mean same HLA, one amino acid difference. Uh, at that point, it just says, okay, this is the same epitope, this is the same epitope motive, I don't need to care about that. Uh, and it actually is able to kind of, yeah, shift between those two. The other case is when you have two wildly different epitopes. And in that case, it actually starts making an internal evaluation. Is this, or is one of these two a false positive in the data? Because like I mentioned, one of the things that we actually built in is we don't really trust all of the data that's in there. So we actually rebuilt a lot of the machine learning framework to actually account for that. Or is this really a very a specific TCR? And we actually have different ways of weighting this sort of thing. And actually account intrinsically into the machine learning framework to account for that. And actually it seems to work quite well. Interesting. Thank you so much. Uh, Peter, one question for the bigger proprietary data set that you have um, from ImmunoWatch. So did you also apply all the methods from the IMREP benchmark on this? I kind of missed that. Um, did we didn't end ranking? up doing that um, because um, let's say one of the things that we're quite careful as a company, because not all of these um, uh, methods have the right necessary licenses that we can just start using them ah. as a company. Okay. Um, yeah. So we didn't want to start messing with uh, yeah. let's say proprietary algorithms in a company and then yeah we, we kind of wanted to stay away from that but that's also why we applied our method to the benchmark um, because we realized that this was a good opportunity to actually also compare our own algorithm to those that have been published mm, 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 mm. and when you showed the box plots from the imrep um, challenge the variances were quite large um, yeah is that also what you meant with if we had enough data, this ranking would actually go go away. That this is kind of because, yeah, it didn't seem very statistically significant. Um, uh, wait, you mean did you did you test for? Hmm, I've killed it. Um, so we we tested. It was statistically significant. Uh, our results from the benchmark uh, compared to the others. No, uh, not in fact, not yours, but um. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from the in -rep, um, the in -rep. Yeah, 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 the, the original one, sure. You mean this one, not right. this one, but the previous one, this one. Yeah, maybe this one, yeah. Yeah, so here, indeed, there's almost no statistical difference between, let's say, the top seven or eight methods. Mm. Um, and indeed, probably, if we had a bit more data, that would be a bit better. Mm. Um, so essentially, the, this assumption here is just purely based on the fact that I actually expected 
the the multi app dot models like NetTCR and Titan to actually outperform things like TCRX, to be honest. Mm. <clears throat> and then in the antibody field, a lot of people are working on affinity data now. This is, I think, something that in, in the TCR field, almost no one is uh, working on, maybe because TCRs have also lower affinity and it doesn't matter so much. I'm not a super TCR expert, but uh, or the data is not there. Um, yeah. Um I think there's an additional complexity in the sense that it's um, for an antibody, it's, it's quite straightforward. You need an antibody, it needs to bind its target, and that's it. And then that the, the entire process kind of stops there, mm -hmm. uh, in a way. <laughs> um, for a T cell, it needs to bind an MHC mm -hmm. with sufficient strength to actually then induce an immune response. And mm -hmm. there have already been a few papers that have shown that there's a difference between interaction between the MHC and the T cell. Um, enough robustness that it actually stays stuck and then mm. inducing the immune response. And actually what we want to see is the inducing the immune response part, mm. Mm. Um, mm. not actually the binding. So mm. probably we shouldn't be looking at affinity for TCRs, but probably even um, T cell activation. Mm. But the data for that is not really there or? No, that's that's that will be only a handful mm. of TCRs. So this is just the first step basically solving the epitope prediction problem. Yeah. 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 And then uh, maybe last question. Um, so this is all sequence based. There are also some approaches that include structure. How do you think about that? Is that important or? Um, I think it, it's, a, it depends on what you're trying to do. Um, if your goal is to, let's say, um, engineer a T cell receptor, um, to, um, let's say enhance maximum affinity then structure-based methods would work quite well. Um, I think if your goal is to classify full repertoires where you have several hundreds of thousands of TCRs per individual, running that through a structure-based method where you need to then dock, it, is it, it possible? It, it is possible, yeah. Now it's possible. I mean, at least on the antibody side, it, it's possible. Yeah, so on the yeah. I mean, even considering all of the epitopes, no, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you would need better docking approaches, but um, but at least docking yeah. is possible. Molecular dynamics not possible. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah, um, mm. and then it also kind and of comes down to broadly asking yeah. more: is it of importance or not? Not if it's really feasible. Yeah, and yeah. that's yeah. something that I can't answer yet, mm. and it depends on is sequence information enough to do these predictions. So far, mm. it seems to be quite good. Um, but, or yes. do we actually need to go to the structure, which of course is determined by the sequence. So this is, let's say, an open question, and I'm interested mm. to see how this evolves, let's say, in the next few years. Would, I think the structure would be nice to get more at those um, interaction motifs to understand which and which residues of the TCR interact with the peptide and so on. But uh, yeah, yeah, but that's going to be most important if you're looking to the engineering problems. If you're thinking yeah. about diagnostics, then you typically don't care no, which exactly. Problem. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Great, and we are perfectly in time. Thanks again, Peter, so much for your talk. It was super yeah. nice.